Well, we don't want this to be another Whit Sunday, so I won't tell another joke. <laughs> Can you see me now? Yes. Johnny Cash was here, the man in black. You would never see him, would you? No. Uh, I'm go I've got uh, a couple of things to say before we get into Genesis 15. Genesis 15. And you might like to open your Bibles at that text. It's just two verses and it'll probably take me two sermons to get through it. So we might make a start today. I'm going to try. Uh, let me see which notes I'll use. I'll use these. Maybe it's a good idea to pray again. But God, we've been praying a lot this morning and we're continuing to pray. We're continuing to surrender our lives to you. We know how difficult that is because we are people of the flesh. We are prone to wander off on our own and not to even so much as think of you. But we want to, uh, we want to be arrested in that regard. We want to be drawn close to you. So... Uh, Help us to be good speakers and good listeners in this next 20 minutes. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes, I had uh, that Paul Scully announcement on my list too, Ron, so I crossed that off. One thing that I did want to mention is the new missions notice board. Well, it's not a new board, but new information. Thanks, Carl, for your great effort in that regard. You're much, uh, that's very neat. Very tidy and very informative. So go and have a look at it after the service. Take your coffee and gather around the missions notice board. <coughs> Yesterday we had the privilege of, uh, of uh, taking our four elder son's children out for the day so that mum and dad could experience what it's like not to have kids whenever they go out. They didn't tell me what they did, but they were in the city and, and uh, tasting all the restaurants, I think, and who knows, it might have even taken in a movie, I don't know. But the youngest is going to be eight years old. How old are you, Georgia? I'm ten. Ten? All oh, right, you've got a couple of years old. <laughs> on, uh, on Lily, her name is Lily, and we've only, she's nearly eight, but we've only seen her for about two or three months in all of her life. But she's very loud and very animated and it's hard to keep up with Lily. And I did have my hearing aids in, and I think I got most of what she was going on about. But it was, it's her eighth birthday on Wednesday, so we took her birthday shopping and got her a watch. That's what she settled on. The other night when we talked to her, she wanted a puppy. But Dad says, no puppies. <laughs> uh, that's all we need. <laughs> but anyway, so we got her a watch, and uh, she put it on and was just fascinated, just press it, it was just a pink watch, but every time you pressed it, the, it lit up, and, the, and she was trying to catch up to me, she was a minute slower than me, so every couple of minutes she'd ask me what time it was, <laughs> and we were walking between Queen Street and Adelaide Street, and, and uh, Granny and Lily were together and uh, had to dodge a car that was coming up slowly, and uh, and she looked at her watch and she wanted to know what time it was and she dashed, dashed around and nearly ran into the front of the car. Oh. Fortunately, the car was in the mouth and it shouldn't have been there. Oh, well, it was a little pain to me. It was an excess um, yeah. should not have had a car. Oh, well, but that's possibly so too. Uh, and it could have been quite a sad story. Um, anyway, thankfully the car stopped in time and Lily <laughs> continued to be her animated self. Until we said goodbye, and I guess mum and dad had a word or two with it. I'm not sure. Anyway, we've been away, and I am the visiting speaker this morning. <laughs> yeah, I've been away for a couple of Sundays, and it's good to be back. Always good to be back at home. And back with, with you lot here. You lot here? I don't know. Have to put up with a lot, don't we, in life? But uh, we, had, we went to the King of Roy Church of Christ Sunday before last. And that was a great time. It's a growing church, interim period between ministers, although they do have an Irishman, I think he is. Uh, is he Irish? And in so, yeah. uh, When he spoke, I thought he must have been American, but uh, John uh, put me right, probably an, Amer an Irish accent. And uh, he's just there until they appoint somebody else. Uh, they were, he was talking on leadership because in a couple of weeks' time, they're appointing new elders and a new board uh, for their church. 
until he spoke from Acts 6, and maybe there'll be a sermon on that. Uh, taking up some of his sermon notes uh, later in the year, if I get around to it. Uh, you will have noticed that uh, I'm in trouble already. Well, you wouldn't have noticed that, but uh, we decided in our last elders meeting that the annual meeting will be on October the 29th. And that's my wife's birthday. Oh. And she, and my, my wife likes to have the children around, the family, the grandchildren, and it will, it's always a grand opportunity, you know, to have an excuse to get the family together. So, uh, yeah. All right. We won't go any further than that just now. But I've got to work on that one. We could have a party here. We could bring them all here. Anyway, that's another story. The other little known secret about King Aroy, and I think Rob and May, you were discovered it too. We went to the observatory on the Wednesday evening at uh, the, near the airport, or at the airport. And it's run by a retired astrophysicist. And it's a great show. Just a couple of hours looking at stars through three telescopes they've got set up in a shed. And they pressed a button and had some Star Wars music going and the roof slid back and you can look up at the, the Milky Way. Actually, you don't need to be out there to see the Milky Way. Here, you can count the stars in the sky at night. If you go to Kingaroy, well, not to Kingaroy, but to Gordonbrook, where I grew up, and there's, no, there's the Milky Way. Uh, millions. Just yeah, millions of stars, billions of stars. And uh, if you've got a good eye, you can see all sorts of individual. Joan uh, found the crown, a constellation of is that the official name, the crown? Yes. Hmm. And we looked at some of the stars in the Southern Cross, and one of them looks like just another star. And you look through the telescope, and you find that there's two stars close together. Yeah, all sorts of things pointing to God's amazing creativity. And indeed, the astrophysicist, uh, in answering one of the uh, questions, suggested that this all happened, you know, you know how it all happened? He said it was G-O-B. It was refreshing to hear somebody in the public domain not sprouting evolutionary theory. His offsider backed him up as well. So that was quite amazing. Indeed, the universe is amazing. It is a mystery, and that's why I've been uh, following through that theme, the mystery of existence in recent months, if not years. I seem to keep going on about it, you know, but uh, it is a mystery, but it's a wonderful mystery that God has created everything and he's created you and me with a purpose. But the other side of it was, uh, we stayed the next weekend at my brother's farm at Tingura. You know, Tingura is only about five k's from Wandai. You know where that is, look it up on the map when you get home. But just south of Wandai, in fact bordering Wandai, is the Wandai State Forest. And as a 20-something year old, 22 year old, I was the uh, overseer in charge of that 30,000 acre iron bark and hardwood forest station. And I lived in a, a grand old Queenslander all by myself up on high stumps. And there was another building about uh, 15 feet by 10 feet wide, which a wooden building, you know, the old railway style building, weatherboards. And that was my office where I estimated the uh, jobs that had to be done next and, and reported timesheets and all that sort of thing. And uh, then there was also a shed for the trucks and the machinery. And uh, I just uh, talked my brother into taking me for a drive through the forestry on the Saturday. And uh, we drove through tracks. They were roads, gravel roads, albeit, but roads nonetheless when I was there. Now it just seems to be run down. It's still forestry. Um, but it's private enterprise now, of course. I think it's an American company, isn't it? It's running Queensland's forests. 
and uh, they're just not spending money on it, obviously. The house is no more. You can't even see that any evidence that there was ever a house there or a shed or a... Instead, there were a set of rails, a, a set of yards, cattle yards. Uh, obviously, some of the forestry had let, sublet the forest to uh, graziers, and, but the, the yards too, I don't know how, old they, how long they were used, but they were just rails lying on the ground. You could see a few stumps sticking up. It was rather depressing going back to my old forest reserve that I would love for those two or three years that I was the overseer before I went to Bible College. It reminds me of something that God has appointed for this world, for this earth, if not the universe, atrophy. The world is running down. Creation ministries will tell you that, that the human race has a used by date. Genetic deterioration means that we aren't going to be around for too many more hundreds or thousands of years, if the Lord allows. We are going to be an extinct race, but the, uh, the world we're living on will uh, deteriorate also in that time. And we may not have any way to live, even if we do survive. So, how's that good news? It may be that we need to get our thoughts and our focus on God a little bit more because we know that with Him we have a purpose in life. Life has meaning with God and that with God alone. So, let's get into Genesis 15. By the way, I didn't look at my watch when I started. Kim. Have you been, have you set the alarm, or how much time have I got? Oh, you haven't even started it. All right, no, I'm not You've on. got 18 minutes. 18 minutes to go. Thank you. I've got eight, it. Eight minutes. Eight, 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 eight seconds? Minutes. Yes. <laughs> well, that will give me time to read the text. All right, Genesis 15. And this morning, oh, by the way, it is a good idea when you're studying the scriptures to look at the context, what's gone before, what's gone after, especially with this text. It starts off with these two words, after this. After what? Well, never mind for the moment. We'll go, go to that in another sermon. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, O sovereign Lord, what can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate is at Yezer of Damascus? And Abram said, You have given me no children, so uh, a servant of, in my household will be my heir. I'll read verse 4 and 5 as well. Then the word of the Lord came to him, This man will not be your heir, but a son coming from your own body will be your heir. He took him outside and said, to the Kingaroy Observatory and said, look up at the heavens and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Okay, get the drift. Some powerful words, some powerful phrases in that. And as uh, Sarah Koenig said, she's the Associate Professor of Biblical Studies at Seattle Public University, Pacific University, I believe. That's what the that's what Google tells me anyway. And she said this, listen carefully, the brevity of this text belies its theological weight. In six verses, in just six verses, we have messages about the reliability and the timing of God's promises, lessons about prayer. I can wake babies up all the time. Wow. Yeah, I hope you're listening. Uh, timings and God's promises, lessons about prayer, and a verse so packed with import that it's quoted in two New Testament passages, that's in Galatians and Romans, by the way, as a linchpin for understanding the relationship between faith and works. All right, so there's plenty of sermons here. I hope to do cover it in two. I, I, I latched on to this passage because... Well, in our Tuesday night Bible study, Rob's missed a couple. He's our visiting speaker too this morning. Thanks, Rob, for sharing with us this morning. Uh, and, uh, yeah, look forward to continuing those Tuesday night studies. We've been a couple of years on, on 
the Old Testament. From Genesis, we got through to 2 Samuel, and we thought, ooh, horrors, we're getting into kings, that's boring stuff. <laughs> this king lived so many years and did these horrible things, and he died, and his records are in the book of the kings, and we thought, this is going to be too boring to spend another 18 months on, so I decided that we would go back and look at some of the key thoughts that uh, there's sort of a thread of God's leading through the history of his people. And of course it starts with Abraham. Well, Abram, not Abraham. He was Abram, wasn't he? Uh, when we read it in Genesis 12 to 15. Yeah. So uh, Abram was having a bit of a relationship with God, his maker. And I think that was probably fairly unusual in those days, but uh, he did have one, a very significant one, so significant in fact that God was able to speak with him personally. I'm going to say a little bit about that in a moment or two. But uh, I, I've gone through all of Genesis and I'm working through Exodus, Rob. Uh, Shibby's taking somebody to the airport, so uh, he can't be here, but uh, this is what we're doing. We're going through, looking at the, uh, the drift, the, uh, the way that God has led, and some of the significant passages of God's revelation to us, or at least to Israel, God's people. And uh, this is the starting point, God choosing Abram to be a special people, to be a special leader. Yeah, and uh, it says, that uh, after this, the word of the Lord came to Abram. The word of the Lord came to Abram, and that's not the end of the sentence, either, in a vision. Unless, of course, you've got the King James Bible in front of you, I think it leaves off that reference, in a vision. But it's certainly in the Hebrew text, I checked it out. And I'll come to that in a moment, too. The word of the Lord came to Abram. Now, we need to ask ourselves, this is a word of the Lord to Abram, but is it a word of the Lord to you and I as well? Or is it just specifically for Abram? We've got to be careful about that because not everything that God says to his servants are for us all, even now, or uh, uh, especially now perhaps. But uh, I believe that what he said to Abram then is a principle of God's working through history and does come down to you and I. So we can take these words at heart. Do not be afraid, Abram. I'll talk about that uh, next time we, we, we uh, well, next time you'll have me, you'll endure me behind the pulpit. Uh, do not be afraid. I'm your shield. Take that on board. I'm your shield. Think battle for a start, shield, battle, but I am your shield. I'm going to be the one who defends you in your battles. Maybe I won't have to preach that other sermon, I forgive this up. Uh, I am your shield, your very great reward. Never mind anything that you might inherit or have in this world. Be more concerned about your eternal reward, your eternal your eternal inheritance, if you like. So I believe these words are for you and I, and indeed they are now published in the Word of God, the Bible that we have. The Word of God has come to us too, and we need to be opening our Bibles regularly and finding out what it's saying to us. And we constantly need to ask from the pulpit, are you doing that? because we're living in an age of lazy Christians in the West. I think it's probably good that we're entering a phase where our, our religious freedoms are being eroded and taken from us. So it will only be those who are diligent for the Lord, who are into the Word and know what He is saying to them, who will remain standing as Christians. As uh, in the communist world, and nowadays in the Muslim world. And so in the future, in the near future, in our humanist Western world, will we all remain standing? Will we be all people who 
constantly devour the Word of God so we know what God is saying to us and how He is protecting us. But it's also our arbitrator. Our, is that the word or is it arbiter? Oh, yeah, I didn't check that one in the dictionary. I could have checked in the Hebrew, but not the English. Every time we hear someone say, the Lord spoke to me, we need to check it out, and they need to check it out against the written word, the Bible. For instance, I think Joan was sharing something last night from the word for today. Uh, someone said, oh, you know, it's all right, am I having an affair? God wants me to ha be happy. Is that scriptural? God wants me to be happy so I can have an affair. Well, it sounds nice, doesn't it? But it's not scriptural. And uh, so, yes, we have to be careful when we say that the Lord has spoken to us. We need to check it out. In fact, the Lord spoke to me. And that's how I come to meet Joan, because the Lord spoke to me. He said, I want you to be a missionary. He didn't say where, but of course the next step was Bible college, and Joan was there, and she just filled out application papers to go to Lebanon, and horrors of horrors, I had to be interested in a foreign country. I've never been overseas before. I didn't have a passport. Yeah, the Lord uh, leads us on a great adventure if we open ourselves up to the word that he speaks in our ears. It's not always in a volcano, not always in a loud voice, but as in Kings, 1 Kings 19, a still small voice, I think one translation puts it, the NASB says it was a, a gently blowing wind God was speaking to uh, Elijah by. I'm not going to uh, rattle the world, I'm just going to speak to individuals gently and beckon them to come. That's his message to the human race. The Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. Well, there's much more I could have said, and it's there, uh, there in my notes too, but in a vision, yes, I'm probably already down to about eight minutes, aren't I? Five! Wow! And I won't even have time for a conclusion. Okay, uh, is the kettle boiling? Um, no, it's not even, oh yes it is. Um, in a vision, the Lord spoke to Abram in a vision. Do you have visions? Oh, the silence every now and again, somebody might have a vision. We have a, a friend, a couple of friends, uh, women who are about our age now, and one of them was a missionary in the Middle East. For a, for a time, but they had a father who wasn't the nicest of fathers. Well, it wasn't the nicest of men. Uh, but he uh, went into hospital for an operation. On the operation table, he had a vision of Christ standing at the foot of the bed, holding his hand out, beckoning him to come, beckoning him to uh, uh, to receive him. But this man recognized his wickedness and was hesitant to hold his hand out. He said that figure he recognized as Jesus was such an attractive being. And what was behind him in this vision was indescribable, he said. And uh, he had a, because of this vision, he couldn't resist. He eventually held his hand out and he was a tr changed man, as you can expect. So visions are happening, do happen. Uh, not to me, I've never had a vision, but let me suggest to you that there is a very fine line between a vision and a dream. The Lord speaking in a vision, that is, and the Lord speaking in a dream. I have had a few dreams that uh, have been significant, and I won't bore you with them just now, and uh, I'm not sure to what extent the Lord was using those dreams. Uh, but a vision is something that happens while you're wide awake. And uh, something happens and gets your attention, uh, you know, sort of an aura or a being. You know what an angel is, don't you? The word angel is really not a translated word. It's just the Greek is angel. They didn't bother to translate it. The word is messenger where you read angel, or angel of God particularly, it's a messenger of God. And that might be the vision, somebody who is unavoidable, unavoidable, somebody you can't resist, you have to, once he speaks, 
or even the first one you see him, you have to listen, if not fall down on your knees in worship. And this is perhaps what Abram saw. Uh, interestingly, and this is a little aside, this will get your attention, the same Hebrew word for vision is the Hebrew word for breast. Uh, something that can be seen, something that can, something that's pretty obvious, in other words, is the meaning behind the uh, Hebrew word for to see, to see clearly, to see, to something that will get your attention, in other words. And uh, I like uh, Numbers 12, where uh, the Lord was speaking, I think, to, uh, to, to Moses. Hear my words, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, may make myself known to him in a vision. I speak with him in a dream. So it's a couple of the two there, dreams and visions. And uh, throughout scriptures you'll find instances of visions, sometimes dreams. And remember Acts chapter 2, in the last days, uh, the young men will dream dreams, and the old men will see visions, the old. No, I'm misquoting it, so you better look it up, uh, because there's women involved in that too. Uh, Carolyn, you'll be pleased to know. And uh, so it's, the ministry is for men and women, and God speaks to us uh, at various times and in various ways. So look out for God speaking to you. Most likely he'll be speaking to you in that still small voice, though, in the words of Scripture. Sometimes you'll be reading and a verse will jump out at you. Well, I'm making verses jump out at me in those Tuesday night Bible studies now as I go through chapter by chapter and picking out significant uh, sentences, significant points of revelation. And uh, I'm being informed already and I hope my Tuesday night Bible study will equally be yeah, informed. But just the final word, I think I've got about half a minute to remind you that it is to Abram in this case. And I want to make the point that God executes his purposes, first of all, through appointing leaders. Uh, the, uh, every organization, every ministry needs somebody to be the chosen, appointed leader who takes responsibility. And in this case, it was Abram. And uh, in our case, well, maybe it's you here at Living Hope. Maybe it's you who are the next generation of leaders of Living Hope. Uh, think about that and pray about that between now and the annual meeting. My tenure as an elder expires then. At this stage, I don't intend to re-stand. Uh, I think it's time for somebody else to be the Elijah after the Elisha has been Oh, no, I don't know whether, you know, how long I've got here on earth, uh, Kim, but I don't know that I've got very much time here behind the pulpit, and you already haven't said what I've just said, probably ready to throw you tomatoes. But how dare you stand down? You are uh, an elder for life. Well, I don't know if that's quite true, but uh, if that were to be the case, we would need to redefine uh, the job description of an elder. Uh, I say no more. But let's bow in prayer and ask you, Lord God, to guide us as people, as a church here, as individual members of it. Help us to be faithful and true to you, come no matter what. And uh, so we come and bow in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Rob. Are you going to sing the last song for us? Yeah, well.